Well, here we are at the live lounge in Portsmouth. Paul Nicholson here alongside me. It's the two-year anniversary of the Modus Super Seas. Could you imagine when we started this project, we'd be where we are now? No. I remember there being a very small room in Southampton, and we were all at a distance. Uh, we were all very careful about what we were doing as well, and we were all very grateful about what we were doing, because if it wasn't for this project, a lot of us would have had a lot more time on our hands, that's for sure. But I think that my lasting memory of the first maybe month of the Southampton project was no referee and hearing players calling their own scores. They were doing something that they hadn't been doing for a while, adding up their scores and figuring things out as they went along. And one of the overriding narratives of that first month in Southampton was, is this upsetting the rhythm of the players? And they were very, very happy when the referees came along. It most certainly gave them something to do. And I suppose when it first started out, the timing of it as well, we were in the middle of lockdowns, we were in the middle of COVID, and everything else that was going on around the, the darting infrastructures as well, politically and everything else, there, there was a gap for amateur players. There was nothing else for them apart from that room in Southampton. There was a hunger for what we actually found. And at the very start, there was a lot of very local players, uh, like Jason Askew, Aaron Monk, Andy Jenkins, Fallon Sherrick, people who were not that far from Southampton. But ultimately, we went as wide as we possibly could, going into places like Scotland and Wales and a little bit further into Northern England. And because of that, we were digging very, very deep to find out uh, if there was talent that could grace uh, the Super Series or what was the live league back then. And we found some gems. Uh, and the most amazing thing to me, uh, apart from the refereeing side of uh, things in the first month, is that the average record for this project is still standing from the very first week. That is unbelievable to me. It still hasn't been beaten. Jason Askew, 118.66. I just wonder if it will ever be beaten. At what point did you realize this is a project that's got something special about it? I think when certain people walk through the door, uh, people like Robert Thornton, uh, Martin Adams, people who were actively seeking out uh, the producers of this program to see if they could take part. Because during the pandemic, there was a lot of people, well, there were a lot of people out there saying, oh, this is just a fad, something to pass the time. But as time went on, and you know, people like James Richardson, for instance, going back to their uh, social media accounts and saying, this is fantastic. And the enthusiasm that we were seeing from the likes of Niall Cullerton and some other players, for me, that was one of the reasons why this uh, product has, has blossomed and the opportunity of coming to Portsmouth came around. But now we have an incredible place to play. I don't think we see the same standard as we have seen in Southampton yet, because we have a larger stage, and that has that somewhat uh, anxiety-riddled stigma with, I'm playing in front of the TV cameras, it's a bigger place. But I think people are getting used to it now, and I think bigger averages are inevitable. And we've unearthed some absolute gems in this competition. I think one that we often talk about is the story of Graham Usher, someone who had success before the pandemic, but in this competition just found his own and has gone on to do some really good stuff in the PDC Pro Tour now. Just think about it this way. Graham Usher in the 2019 World Masters was on an upward trend. Then the pandemic hits. What does he do if this wasn't around? I don't think he's on the tour if it wasn't for this. I think he's got a lot to thank the Super Series for. He's made a lot of money, as has Robert Owen. And in a funny sort of way, their careers have been kick-started by this project, and they won't be the only ones. And they've become household names because of this. They're names that people become synonymous to. I mean, you look at the World Championships, for example, when the likes of Robert Owen, the likes of Raymond Smith came into that tour, and people were talking about what they did here, whereas in the past, maybe qualifiers that come through the routes that they come through probably wouldn't have got the attention if this wasn't about. Absolutely right. I think there have been players coming to this venue and to Southampton in the latter days who were saying, oh, no, Robert Owen's in the group. He knows how to do it better than anybody. And then you think about players like Connor, uh, uh, Conan Whitehead, sorry. And you think about how their careers have, have, have gone well with this project. And there are people out there who play here on such a regular basis that when they're not here, they miss it. That's a great thing. And as a player, missing something is a good, good thing. And they want to get back on the stage to have more opportunities like a Saturday night.
It's probably one word that is the antithesis of this competition. That's the word opportunity. And we could probably label this in a, in, in a number of different ways. I want to begin with the organizations that this project's now partnered up with. The ADC perhaps being the one that stands out, the players that came through here. Three players from the previous Champions Week came through that mm -hmm. qualification route. And it's given players the opportunity to play in front of the TV cameras that probably would never got the chance before. I mean, look at the story of Adam Warner, for example, came from an ADC qualifier, won a week here, the money he got for winning that week put him into Q score and has now won a tour card. It's only a mere drop in the ocean to what is possible here. You think about the, uh, the European tour for PDC pros over the last 10 years, the effect that that's had on players being ready for bigger stages. This is another way of jumping from sterile environments with no exposure to social media or TV cameras, but you come here and you get more... Uh, comfortable with the cameras in your face and the bright lights if you can start playing your proper game on this stage there's no reason why you can't then go to an even bigger stage and potentially win the biggest prize on offer here of twenty thousand pounds conan whitehead knows what it's like to win that prize raymond smith knows and they're not going to be the only ones over the course of 2023 and beyond because this project has got legs it's an opportunity not just for players but for people behind the scenes. I mean, look at the likes of, for example, Charlie Corsafine, mm -hmm. who's been here from the very start. He refereed a UK Open semi-final last week. The likes of Owen Binks, who he's made darts his full-time uh, profession because of this. Some of the people behind the scenes have made darts mm -hmm. their full-time profession because of this. This has given not just players opportunities, but many, many other people opportunities within this sport. And yourself, myself, mm -hmm. other people. I've been able to work with Chris Mason a lot more, which makes me very happy. I've gotten to know Matthew Edgar a lot better, which is fantastic. And the ability to work with some new people, uh, including Abigail Davis as well, who's a good friend of mine, just to be able to talk about the sport in a slightly different way as well about another level. Because we talk a lot about the, the cream of the crop, the PDC elite and the WDF cream of the crop. But now we have our own little cream of the crop here. And it's great to know a certain depth of the sport, maybe better than some other people, because we get access to the players in the practice room and mm -hmm. uh, when they come up here. And we, we, can, we can thrive with that. But I'm really thrilled for not just us as broadcasters and the players, but the people who now love darts, who are able to work with it, the spotters, the scalpers, the producers, people who do the lights. Mm. These are unsung, hero, unsung heroes in broadcasting. They never get any mentions, and they deserve it. And just finally, if we're sat in these chairs again in two years' time, what do you expect the next step of the evolution of the Moda Super Series to be? Well, I'm probably going to need some more hair dye uh, because I'll probably have more gray hairs. <laughs> but I think it's really interesting to see what happens next. As to what is possible, I think that is very much down to uh, the, uh, the organisers. Mm -hmm. I think the ability to evolve has been this project's biggest strength. They could have easily kept to one camera during the pandemic, where it's just two boards on a screen. You see where the darts go. Yes, that's fantastic. But within weeks, they were saying, how do we make it better? How do we make it a split system where we can see the player at the same time? How do we make that better? Let's go to a studio. Let's go to a bigger studio. As for what they want to do next, I leave that to them. And I'm excited. It has been an exciting time. It's been an absolute pleasure to work on this project. I'm sure Paul absolutely agrees with that. The two-year anniversary of the Moda Super Series. Happy birthday to them. And, well, the future, well, anything is possible, isn't it? So Paul Nelson's reflections on two years of the Moda Super Series. He's going to be joining me up on the balcony very shortly to look ahead to the semi-finals action at the Moda Super Series for week five. I hope you can join us on the other side of this short break. <laughs>